welcome back everyone and uh, it is my pleasure to welcome our next speaker who is uh, Dr. Holly Clark from Florida State University. We're very happy to have you and the floor is yours. Perfect, thank you so much. Share my screen and hopefully everyone can see my screen, hopefully. Okay, awesome. So we'll go ahead and get started. So thank you for having me today at this amazing conference so far. And as you can see from the title, uh, my presentation is going to be about the potential role of creatine in vascular health. And I will just say a quick thank you to my major professor, Dr. Robert Hickner, as well as Dr. Michael Ormsby as well for their support uh, during the production of these review papers. So just a quick outline of what I'm going to be going over with you guys today. I'm going to touch upon the impact of vascular disease, followed by the presence of creatine within the vasculature. And then I'm going to touch upon those potential mechanisms in which we believe that creatine can impact vascular health, followed by our research and findings, and then the future directions that we have at Florida State University. So first, let's talk about the impact of vascular disease. Now, as many of you probably already know, cardiovascular diseases remain the leading cause of mortality within the United States and within the world at the moment. So as you can see from this data set right here, you can see that heart disease is the leading cause of death within, within the United States. And if you go down this list just a little bit, you can see stroke there is also a leading cause of mortality within the United States. Now, when we talk about cardiovascular disease, we're talking about the diseases that affect the heart and or the vasculature within the body. So in addition to cardiovascular diseases, we also have some very common vascular diseases. And some of the more common vascular diseases can include atherosclerosis, peripheral artery disease, hypertension, stroke, as well as coronary heart disease as well. And we'll just draw your attention to hypertension right here. According to the CDC, around 47% of all adults within the United States currently suffer from hypertension. So I definitely wasn't kidding when I said that vascular diseases can be extremely common. Now, vascular diseases are extremely complex and multifactorial, but there are a few etiological causative factors that underlie these diseases. So the first one is gonna be oxidative stress. Now, oxidative stress is an accumulation of damaging free radicals. And oxidative stress actually underlines multiple pathologies, not just vascular disease, which is why it's a primary target for a lot of interventions. Next, we have dyslipidemia, or a high or a dysfunctional level of circulating lipids within the body. Now, this could be high total cholesterol, could also be high LDLs as well. We then have hyperglycemia, which is a high level of blood glucose. Now this is a common etiological factor of vascular disease, and it's why many people suffering from diabetes often have hypertension, for example, as well. We then have mitochondria, and as you probably know from your early biology lessons, the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, so it's extremely important for cell health and integrity. So mitochondrial dysfunction is an etiological cause of vascular disease and many other pathologies as well. And then we have inflammation or the circulation of inflammatory cytokines. Now these cytokines can damage the arterial walls and lead to stiffness and hardening, which is often seen in atherosclerosis. So we know some of the reasons behind these vascular diseases and we know how common these vascular diseases can be. So what current treatments do we have? We might have heard of all the pharmaceutical and surgical interventions that we have. Pharmaceuticals such as beta blockers or diuretics, and then extreme cases, surgery such as like implementing stents. However, the main barrier associated with these is that they're commonly very invasive. They're also very expensive. They're also inaccessible to many people and can have a lot of side effects. Now, I'm definitely not here today to tell you that we shouldn't be taking these pharmaceutical agents. They do help and they do help with the management of vascular diseases. However, we do know now through science that there's a lot of supplements out there and a lot of nutraceuticals as well that can help benefit vascular health and health in general. So some common supplements that have been shown to help benefit vascular health include vitamins C, D and E. We've also seen certain foods help vascular health, 
such as blueberries, strawberries, watermelon, as well as some spices as well, such as turmeric. Now, the good thing about these is they're often non-invasive. They're also very accessible and easy to introduce into the diet. Now, again, I'm not saying that we should not be using pharmaceuticals. However, I am saying that possibly we can use these supplements and nutraceuticals as adjuvant therapies to help promote vascular health. Now, before I get into how I think creatine could benefit the vascular health, I'm first going to show the research that does show that creatine is in the vasculature. So Loy Cattell in 1992 found that there was indeed phosphocreatine and ATP stores within bovine aortic endothelial cells, as well as human umbilical vein endothelial cells. He also found the expression of the isoenzymes BB, MM, and mitochondrial creatine kinase. Next, we have Windischbauer et al. in 1994. He also found the presence of phosphocreatine and ATP in this human umbilical vein endothelial cells, in addition to the presence of the creatine kinase enzyme. Next, we have Deking, and he showed the presence of creatine, phosphocreatine, ATP, and the creatine transporter within aortic endothelial cells and microvascular endothelial cells as well. And then finally, Numura et al. in 2003, he found that in cultured cells, there was the presence of phosphocreatine, ATP, in addition to that transporter as well. So we know that creatine is present within the vasculature, but who's actually looked at creatine and its possible influences on vascular health within humans? Now, funny enough, when I done my review of literature, we found very few studies actually looking at the impact of creatine on blood flow or any type of vascular measure. Here are just a few of the ones that we did find. So our Sierra in 2001 did look at creatine and how it impacted forearm and calf blood flow. And he found that the group that was taking creatine did have an increase in forearm blood flow as well as calf blood flow. However, this was only evident in the group that took creatine and resistance training. Now, Sanchez Gonzalez in 2011 also looked at creatine and how it impacted the vessel or the vascular responses following exercise. And he found that following creatine supplementation, there was a decrease in the systolic blood pressure response to exercise and a significant decrease in the heart rate response to exercise. He also found a significant decrease in the time taken for heart rate to return to its resting levels. Now, Moraz and Van Bavel, both down the bottom here, these two actually directly looked at creatine and how it impacted the microvasculature, so the smaller capillaries, arteries, and arterioles. Now, they both found that following creatine supplementation, there was significant improvement in functional capillary density and functional capillary recruitment as well. Furthermore, Moraz also showed that there was a decrease in total cholesterol and total LDLs. Now, this research is extremely important. However, there is one limitation that I wanted to point out to you all today, and this is going to be the population. Now, when we look at the population throughout these four studies, and we can see that they chose to use mostly healthy, active males and females. Now, it is really important for us to use accessible and feasible populations during science. However, my main question was, are we truly going to see the impact of creatine on the vasculature when we look at a population that hasn't got any room really for improvement? So that led me to my next question, whether or not if we gave creatine to a population that had vascular disease or at risk of vascular disease, maybe we would see these changes, but heightened. So that led me to my main review of literature and these um, review papers that we've published, looking at the potential mechanisms for creatine and vascular health. Now we have our well-supported benefits of creatine, including muscle strength and muscle power and improved recovery as well. But when we take a look at those risk factors for vascular disease, we don't really see much connection between the two. However, as we know, and as we're learning throughout this conference, there are way more benefits to creatine than we once first believed. In fact, there is evidence to suggest that creatine can work as an antioxidant, as a lipid lowering agent, and even to function as an anti-inflammatory. Now, when we look at these potential benefits, 
we could possibly see a connection there between those new benefits and the risk factors for vascular disease. So first, I'm going to look at creatine as an antioxidant. Now, at the start of this presentation, I touched upon how the accumulation of free radicals or oxidative stress is associated with multiple diseases, including vascular disease. And we know through science that through the intervention of antioxidants, we can reduce these free radicals and thereby offsetting the deleterious effects. Now, Matthews et al. was one of the first individuals to look at creatine and how it might function as an antioxidant within a neurotoxicity model, specifically looking at Huntington's disease. Now, he found that following creatine supplementation, there was significant improvement or increase in phosphocreatine stores within the striatum, indicating a creatine transporter being present. He also saw a decrease in striatal lesion and striatal lesion volume as well, following neurotoxicity. So this highlighted the potential for creatine to be neuroprotective. But he also found that following creatine, there was a significant reduction in hydroxyl free radical generation. And as you can see from this image right here, those red rats fed, fed the normal diet had a significant increase in that free radical generation. However, those that were fed creatine in addition had a significantly blunted increase in those free radicals. Now, Laura et al. was one of the first to look at the direct impact of creatine as an antioxidant. But Laura didn't just look at one type of oxidative stress. He looked at hydrogen peroxide, superoxide, lipid peroxidation, peroxynitrite, as well as the overall antioxidant scavenging capacity. Now, Lawler found once he supplemented creatine, there was a significant decrease in ABTS, which was indicative of an improvement in scavenging capacity. He also saw a significant decrease in superoxide ra radicals, and he also saw a significant decrease in peroxynitrite. Now, all three of these are what we call charged free radicals. And unfortunately, he didn't see any changes with the other free radicals that he looked at. But overall, Lawler did conclude that this evidence suggested that creatine could work as a direct antioxidant. So Cecilia et al. in 2006 wanted to try and translate that, try to take what Lawler found and translate it into an in vitro environment. So he looked at creatine supplementation and how it might help cell vitality following oxidative stress. And I'm mainly going to focus on the human umbilical vein and the filial cells. Now, he found that following creatine supplementation, there was a significant increase in survival following oxidative stress. And as you can see from this image right here, the black dots are the cells that received creatine. The blank dots are the ones that did not receive creatine. And as you can see, the percent survival was increased in those cells that received creatine even following hydrogen peroxide. He also found that there was a significant increase in intracellular creatine content as well as phosphocreatine content. And that when he inhibited the creatine transporter, there was no longer this increase in intracellular creatine and no longer these benefits. And now finally, Rahimi in 2011. Now he was one of the first to look at creatine as an antioxidant, but within humans specifically. And he wanted to look at whether or not creatine could function as an antioxidant against exercise induced free radicals. So he used a dose of four by five grams a day for seven days, which is a common loading phase. And he found that those supplement with creatine had a significant reduction in 8-hydroxydeoxyguanosine immediately and 24 hours post-exercise. Now this right here is a marker of oxidative DNA damage. So creatine su su successfully reduced that. He also saw a reduction in the increase in malondialdehyde, which is a marker of lipid peroxidation. So overall, he concluded that indeed, creatine did have the ability to function as an antioxidant against exercise-induced free radicals. So what does this mean for the vasculature? Where am I going with this? Well, we've shown so far some evidence to show that creatine may be able to directly and indirectly reduce free radicals. Now, I want to take your attention down here to the NO. 
This is nitric oxide, and nitric oxide is extremely important for vascular endothelial function. In fact, individuals with low nitric oxide bioavailability have a greater risk of cardiovascular disease. So if we can decrease the amount of ROS in the body through creatine, we may be able to increase the amount of nitric oxide we have. Furthermore, we'll take you down this path right here, looking at BH4. Now, BH4 stands for tetrahydrobiopterin and is a really important cofactor needed for the production of nitric oxide. But unfortunately, BH4 is often attacked by free radicals. So again, if we can reduce free radicals following creatine, we may be able to increase BH4, thereby increasing the production of nitric oxide. So all of this could lead to an increase in nitric oxide bioavailability, which would have a positive effect on vascular health. So next we'll look at creatine and the mitochondria. Now I won't spend too long on this slide because there is a talk tomorrow by Dr. Robert Marshall that will focus upon the impact of creatine supplementation within the mitochondrial specifically. However, I will just draw your attention first to this picture here. That unfortunately mitochondrial dysfunction is characterized by high ROS and high mitochondrial ROS also. And that this can be connected to various pathologies such as cardiovascular disease. Now I wanna take your attention right here to this image right here or this little symbol right here. This means the change in mitochondrial membrane potential. And this is really important. It's really important for us to control or to regulate the membrane potential. If we don't, or during the dysregulation of this membrane potential, we have an increase in ROS production. So therefore it is evident that during different diseases, this membrane potential is dysregulated, which is often leading to the increase in ROS. So now looking at this picture right here, we can see that mitochondrial creatine kinase and creatine and phosphocreatine play a big role within the mitochondria. In fact, mitochondrial creatine kinase alongside creatine and phosphocreatine help to ensure the ATP shuttle. So in other words, they help to take ATP from areas of production, such as the electron transport chain, through into the cell for areas of usage. The mitochondrial creatine kinase also helps with what we call ADP recycling within the mitochondria. Now, both of these effects help to keep the sustenance and the maintenance of the membrane potential. So they're very important. Now, Maya and Barbariari both wanted to look at how creatine supplementation and this mitochondrial creatine kinase could help in times of mitochondrial dysfunction. Now, Maya et al. looked specifically at hyperglycemia. And obviously, during hyperglycemia, which is oxidative stress, we actually have a dysregulation in this membrane potential and an increase in mitochondrial ROS. However, Maya found that when he supplemented creatine, it actually saw a better um, sustenance and maintenance of this membrane potential and therefore a reduction in mitochondrial ROS. Barbarieri showed the same thing, but in response to hydrogen peroxide. Barbarieri also showed that creatine supplementation helped to promote the stability and the integrity of the mitochondria. So again, where am I going with this? Well, many vascular diseases can be characterized by mitochondrial dysfunction. So if here we're showing that creatine and creatine kinase is really important for the maintenance of mitochondrial health, we could therefore give this as a supplementation to help promote membrane stability and therefore reduce mitochondrial ROS and reduce the burden seen in vascular disease. So next we have creatine and inflammation. And if you tuned in earlier to Dr. Dreshner's talk about the immune response, you saw that creatine can work as a possible anti-inflammatory. We know that chronic inflammation is closely associated with endothelial dysfunction and vascular health. And therefore, if we can reduce or maintain inflammation or reduce it mainly, uh, we can, in other words, promote vascular health. So Nomura et al. was one of the first individuals to look at creatine and how it may function as an anti-inflammatory. And he found that following creatine supplementation, there was an increase in creatine and phosphocreatine stores within endothelial cells. 
he also found that there was a decrease in endothelial permeability or cell leakiness ultimately induced by serotonin and hydrogen peroxide. He also found a decrease in neutrophil adhesion to the endothelial cells and he saw an inhibition of ICAM and E-selectin, both of what, which are inflammatory cytokines. So what is this, how is this going to help? Well, ultimately we've shown that creatine can reduce permeability and reduce the adhesion of these cytokines. So vascular dysfunction or vascular disease is often characterized by leaky membranes and all these inflammatory cytokines. So again, if creatine can help mitigate that, creatine may be able to help with vascular health. Next, we look at creatine and lipids. Now, as you probably know, High circulating triglycerides and LDLs are often closely associated with vascular disease risk. Therefore, if we can reduce these circulating lipids, we can improve vascular health and longevity. So Ernest et al. was one of the first people to look at creatine and how it might function as a lipid lowering agent. Now he used a dose of five grams a day for eight weeks, which is quite a long dose. And he looked at a population of people with hyperlipidemia, in other words, people presenting with high lipids in their blood already. He found that following creatine supplementation, there was a significant decrease in total cholesterol by 6% and 5% at weeks 4 and 8 respectively. He also saw a significant reduction in triacylglycerols, as well as very low LDLs by 23 and 22% at weeks four and eight. So Ernest et al concluded that creatine could indeed help as a lipid lowering agent, but specifically in people with high lipids already. Now Moraz, I mentioned earlier, he actually looked at creatine within the microvasculature, but he also took blood from his participants and ran a very basic lipid profile. And he found that following 20 grams a day for one week, there was also a significant reduction in total cholesterol and LDLs. Now, I will just say there is evidence that suggests that creatine cannot lower lipids, but I do believe there is more room for research within this area. So how might this be happening? Well, before I go into the how, I hope you all tuned in to Dr. Guano's talk yesterday regarding the potential of creatine in glucose management and diabetes. Quite often in individuals with diabetes or those suffering from insulin insensitivity, we often see a high amount of circulating lipids as well as a consequence of this. So possibly as an indirect mechanism, if creatine can help improve insulin sensitivity and decrease blood glucose, we could ultimately say we may see a decrease in circulating lipids, but definitely more research is needed in that area. Now, in addition to that, there is a few uh, pieces of evidence out there that shows that creatine might also have the capability of lowering hepatic lipid accumulation, so lipids in the liver specifically. So both Demenis in 2011 and De Silva in 2014 looked to see whether or not creatine supplementation could reduce hepatic lipid accumulation. They both found that following creatine supplementation there was a significant reduction in hepatic lipid accumulation, a significant reduction in hepatic triglyceride accumulation. They also saw a significant reduction in lipid peroxidation and an increase in the stimulation of fatty acid oxidation. As you can see from this image right here, this is the control group. And this is the high fat fed group right here. And you can see by, by the staining, there's a lot of lipid accumulation happening in these hepatocytes. However, with the high fat and creatine group, you can see a significantly reduced amount of staining, which shows a significant reduction in lipid accumulation. Now, how might this be happening? Well, they propose that this might be happening due to the sparing of hepatic SAM. Now, SAM stands for s adenosylmethionine, and it's a really important methyl donor within the liver. So sparing that could help reduce lipid accumulation. They also reported, however, that creatine supplementation led to the normalization and changes in gene expression in regards to those for beta oxidation. Now, you might be asking yourself, how am I going to link hepatic fat accumulation to lipids and vascular health? 
Well, if you look at the literature out there, you can actually see that hepatic fat accumulation and, for example, people with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease actually have a heightened chance or risk of vascular disease as well. In fact, they often interplay with one another. So therefore, if we can decrease hepatic lipid accumulation, we could ultimately also be indirectly supporting vascular health. Lastly, I have creatine and EDHFs. Now, EDHFs stand for endothelial-derived hyperpolarization factors. Now, quite like nitric oxide and prostacycline, EDHFs are really important to help with the control of the size of the vessels in the body and therefore the control of blood flow and blood pressure regulation. In fact, even when you inhibit nitric oxide and inhibit prostacycline, you still see some vasodilation due to the compensatory role that EDHFs play. It's also important to point out that EDHFs are reliant upon the activation of potassium channels, most of which are ATP dependent. So Dezia and Shlevanov in their publications looked at these potassium channels and how they were co-localized with phosphotransfer enzymes. So you can see from this image right here, we have a potassium channel and you can see that it is ATP dependent. You can also see here co-localized is a creatine kinase. Now they believed the creatine kinase system working to take ATP from areas of production to areas of usage up here helped and supported the function of these potassium channels. Now, Guerrero et al. in 1997 wanted to test this theory, and he looked at the impact of different ATP generating systems upon the function of the sodium potassium pump. Now, the sodium potassium pump is also a very important pump needed for the stimulation and the propagation of EDHFs. It's also ATP dependent. Now, Guerrero found that even when he inhibited glycolysis, which is this image right here, and when he inhibited oxidative phosphorylation, which is this image right here, he found that the creatine kinase system was capable of promoting and supplying the ATP needed to sustain the sodium potassium pump activity. Furthermore, the creatine kinase system with three millimolar of phosphocreatine again supported the ATC, ATP supply needed for the sodium potassium pump activity. So again, how am I tying this into vascular health? Well, like I said from the start, these pumps or channels are extremely important for the propagation and initiation of EDHFs. That the creatine kinase system is really important and contributes greatly to the ATP needed for these pumps. So therefore, if we supplement creatine and we can help support the substrates of the creatine kinase system, we can actually be supporting the function of these channels, thereby supporting the promotion of the propagation and initiation of these EDHFs, and therefore the control of vessel size and ultimately vascular health. Now, I've probably provided so much information, more information than you wanted at this time of the day. Um, if you would like more information regarding the mechanisms that we touched upon um, in regards to vascular health, I will direct you to our two review papers, one in 2020 and one in 2021, as we do go into more depth about how these mechanisms may be helping with vascular health. But ultimately, it was all these mechanisms that brought me to my dissertation research that I performed last year. And my main dissertation topic was to look at the impact of creatine supplementation on vascular endothelial function. So I'm just going to share with you what we've done. So my main objectives were to determine the effects of four weeks of creatine monohydrate on both the macro, so the larger arteries, and the microvasculature as well. I also wanted to look at how creatine monohydrate could affect reactive oxygen species. My main hypothesis was that four weeks of creatine monohydrate would decrease the age-related vascular deteriorations and decrease the ROS, thereby improving endothelial function. So what was my design? I used a crossover, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled design. I used a four-week supplementation dose 
with a loading phase and then a maintenance phase as well. And again, this population was older adults aged 50 to 64. To look at macrovascular health, I looked at brachial artery flow mediated dilation. For microvascular health, I used forearm near infrared spectroscopy. And then to look at those free radicals in the system, I used a few ELISAs and I mainly looked at malondialdehyde as a marker of lipid peroxidation, oxidized LDL, and then BH4, which is that really important cofactor needed for nitric oxide. So what did we find, the interesting stuff? Well, we found that following creatine supplementation, there was significant improvement in flow mediated dilation. In fact, we saw an improvement around 1.22%, which is considered physiologically significant. Now, when we do flow mediated dilation, it's also really important to normalize this value in accordance to the stimuli, which is shear stress. But even after we normalized our values for shear stress, we still saw a significant improvement in that flow mediated dilation following creatine in comparison to placebo. Really interesting things. In regards to the microvascular function, we saw something very similar. Following creatine supplementation, we saw a significant improvement in the 10 second reperfusion rate. So how quickly did oxygen resaturate that area we were looking at? So again, we saw a significant improvement following creatine, but no change in the placebo. Unfortunately, with our oxidative stress biomarkers, we didn't see any changes with any of them. We did see a trend towards a significant decrease in MDA. However, like I said, there wasn't really any other significance around there. But regardless of that, we still saw this 16% improvement in flow media dilation. Now, FMD is the gold standard assessment of endothelial function. We also saw a 33% improvement in normalized FMD and a 62% improvement in microvascular reperfusion. We had some additional findings as well. We also saw an improvement in short-term memory function, so cognitive function. We also saw an improvement in total torque production, which was unsurprising considering the benefits of creatine and muscle. And then we also saw a significant decrease in glucose and triglycerides following creatine, which is kind of supporting that previously mentioned by other authors. So what are our future directions and projects at Florida State University? So next on the list is we're going to look at the impact of acute direct creatine perfusion using microdialysis on muscular ROS and blood flow. We're going to try and take what Lawler found and translate that into humans. We're also going to carry on looking at the impact of creatine supplementation on cognitive health and performance in older adults. We're then going to look at the impact of acute direct creatine perfusion using microdialysis on specific sites of ROS production. So what we'll do is we'll inhibit the mitochondria, inhibit NADPH oxidase, and look at how creatine may be offering its antioxidant potential. And then finally, if grant funding permits it, we would like to look at the impact of creatine supplementation on brain phosphogen content and neurological performance in older adults with mild cognitive impairment, trying to look at that vascular dementia. So concluding remarks, the scientific literature surrounding the diverse potential of creatine is growing, hence why we have such an amazing conference like today. We know that creatine plays an evidential role in health, and I touched upon just a few of the mechanisms today in which I believe that creatine could directly and or indirectly infer benefits towards vascular health. The in vitro evidence does support the feasibility of these mechanisms, but we are lacking a little bit of in vivo evidence. So we need to keep asking questions and keep exploring. We can't be satisfied. We should take this further and continue to ask those novel and innovative questions of how creatine could be applied in different ways. We also need further translational science. We also need more realistic target populations. I use the group of older adults between 50 and 64 because aging can result in the deterioration of vascular health. However, I'd love to take what I've done during my dissertation and repeat that in an at-risk population such as those already with hypertension. And again, like I said, our research did highlight the potential of creatine to improve vascular health in older adults. 
but further investigation is still needed and we're hoping to kind of forward that and go along with that at Florida State University. So thank you so much for your attention. I do hope you've enjoyed this talk and that this has perhaps opened your attention to different ways in which creatine could be applied. Thank you so much and I'll take any questions at the end of the day.